Good morning. How's everybody feeling? Fantastic. I, you know, over the last 27 years of my career with Lockton, it, it never ceases to amaze me at the type of talent we're able to attract. How about those last three? You're going to help, you're going to help take us to the next level, so welcome aboard. Now, I'm up here to introduce our, our guest speaker today, and I'm very excited to do so. I had the opportunity to listen to John speak in Boston at, at our RIMS uh, Global Partner Meeting, and uh, take a few notes, and you're going to be the most interesting man or woman at your next cocktail party, I can assure you. His name is John Sidalides. He's one of the world's leading experts on global risk trends and geopolitical risk management. Following a distinguished career in public service, he founded one of the most sought after government affairs firms in the US. For over a decade, he's chaired the State Department's Advanced Area Studies Program for Southeast Europe at the Foreign Service Institute, and now discusses global risk trends and geopolitical risk with the country's most prominent corporate decision makers. John, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lenny. Great. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Lenny, for that kind introduction. And a major thank you to Ron and to Peter for welcoming me here today to be with all of you for what I hope will be a very engaging and somewhat eye-popping presentation on what is happening around the world in ways that are extraordinarily compelling for all of you who are involved in the global insurance and risk management business. Before I begin, I just need to put one disclaimer out there. Uh, as you heard from Lenny's bio, uh, the introduction, uh, I do work with the State Department. However, the State Department is a client of my firm, so that nothing that I say here today represents in any capacity State Department policy, US government policy, or administration policy. So we're all clear, I'm speaking here in a completely private and independent capacity. So let's just get that taken care of. Um, you know, sometimes speakers come up before an audience like yours and they'll soften you up with a joke and the like. If you don't mind, we have a lot of very serious, critical issues to explore here today. Our time is somewhat limited and I want to get as much information to you as possible. And what I thought I would do in coordination with uh, our locked-in executives is to deliver this information to you in what I would call a simplified, generalized, national security briefing format. Geopolitical intelligence to be included, and not surprisingly, only using public domain sources. So uh, on that, what I'd like to do, ladies and gentlemen, is give you a sense of why in my own personal capacity, I believe that we are entering if not having already entered, probably the most complex and dangerous global landscape that we have faced in 30 years. For those of you as old as I am, since the end of the Cold War in the late 80s, early 90s. And I'm going to try to explain to you why we are facing a strategic competition that will likely last for decades, deep into the 21st century. And I hope I'm wrong, but I'm seeing early indications that this may become an ideological divide as we experienced during the Cold War. But what I'd like to do first is just give you a sense of the connectedness of all of the issues that I want to put on the table for you this morning. And I start out with a beautiful map of our world, flattened, unfortunately, but it's all I can do for representation purposes here. But we're terrestrial creatures, ladies and gentlemen, right? We're land-based creatures, and we often forget that waterways, the oceans, the seas, cover about 70% of the Earth's surface. And about 90% of all international commerce traverses on our world's waterways. And about 80% of all oil and natural gas that is shipped around the world on our oceans and waterways. And so I just need to emphasize the absolute primacy of the free and open international system that we've enjoyed here in the US, our Western and non-Western partners and allies around the world, all having access to free and open shipping to be able to participate in this international commercial system. 
And this is a great map. It's a CIA fact book snapshot of the global economy. But it gives you a sense of the primary exports, products and services of countries around the world. And again, to emphasize the point as to how the global economy has worked relatively effectively for the last 70 years, ever since this rules-based order was put into place after World War II, and especially consolidated as we know it now with the end of the Cold War since the early 1990s. But the ability to trade freely and openly is essentially dependent on the ability of the United States working with regional allies and partners to maintain free and open shipping lanes and, of course, the airways above those sea lanes. But we're now facing a new phase in the context of international commerce. And I think a little bit of history is useful here first before we talk about where we're going in the US-China relationship, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll just speak for Americans here. I know this is a very international audience. But we Americans tend to be somewhat ahistorical in our analyses. We need to be better at that. But this is a great chart here that gives you a sense of just how utterly dominant China's economy was relative to the world economy for nearly 2,000 years. So for our purposes here, starting in 1 AD until about the mid-1800s, you see that the Chinese and Indian economies were by far the largest economies in the world. And this ended really in the mid-1800s with the rise of the Western economies in the context of the Industrial Revolution. And you see China's proportion its ranking in the global economy shrinking tremendously from the mid-1800s until, factually, just about two or three decades ago. In China, a great 5,000-year-old civilization, it knows its place in the world. It was called the Middle Kingdom for a very important reason. The Chinese people have long believed that China really is at the center of a place in the cosmos between the heavens and the Earth, the Earth being all of the lesser societies in Asia that would pay tribute to China for centuries as the greatest economic and military power in the area. And now, China is determined to restore itself to that Middle Kingdom status as the central player in the world economy. And we see this meteoric rise of China really since 2001, when China was permitted to join the World Trade Organization. Uh, at that time, it had a, an economy of about $1.7 trillion. You see now, with this chart here, I think this is a 2018 graphic, it's almost uh, 15, 16, no, 14 trillion dollars. So the Chinese economy has grown about 800% in less than two decades. But as we've come to realize, especially the last several years, much of this growth has been predicated on deceptive practices by the Chinese government on the world stage. So we talk about intellectual property theft. We talk about forced technology transfers. We talk about massive subsidies of state-owned enterprises, uh, charges of currency manipulation, uh, a whole host of issues that many countries now feel have unfairly, at their own expense, brought China to this place of primacy on the world stage. And this is really now at the heart of the US-China trade talks currently underway. We see here President Trump uh, with, uh, I'll call him President Xi Jinping. I'll explain shortly why his more important title is General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, which we often overlook in the West in terms of his actual power status in China. But they're now hopefully going to close out phase one of this trade arrangement or trade rearrangement, we should say. And I believe there is a December 15th notional deadline because if there isn't a trade agreement by then, the Trump administration will impose the next series of very serious tariffs on a whole host of Chinese uh, consumer product exports to the United States. And uh, I think there was hope that we might have some announcement the last couple of days I think as of last night or this morning, the talk is possibly a meeting in London or elsewhere in Europe. And um, we'll probably have agreement on the purchase of American food products, maybe some greater protection of intellectual property rights and the like. I think we're going to face some serious sticking points with US requirements for effective compliance and enforcement. 
And then, of course, the fact that this is literally a phase one and that the structural reforms that the U.S. has sought over the last several years are not only not going to be included in this agreement, but depending on the election outcome in 2020, may not be anything that the Chinese would have to negotiate with the U.S. administration in the years to come. And my own sense is that's, that's President Xi's goal, right? They came very close to a major comprehensive trade agreement until May of this year when the hardliners in the Chinese Communist Party insisted there would be no changes to Chinese laws, only administrative changes, but they will not change their constitution or their laws in order to accommodate U.S. pressures. It's simply not uh, allowable in the current context of Chinese politics. So we're facing a very difficult situation on the trade, uh, on the trade landscape, ladies and gentlemen. Again, partial good news, and I think the markets are reflecting that, but in terms of structural reforms, still quite a ways to go. Now, uh, President Xi, I think, is really responsible for the new ways in which we're viewing China since he came to power in 2012. And again, he's, he's 66. He's rewritten uh, the Chinese constitution so that he's not bound by the two term limits that we had with prior Chinese presidents. So where his term might be up in 2022, uh, we'll see if he's seriously challenged by other leaders in the Chinese Politburo, depending, I think, primarily on how he manages the US relationship. But he could be president for life, sort of a, a dictatorial status. We'll see how this plays out. But I do want to lay out for you, ladies and gentlemen, sort of three strategic areas of competition between China and the United States that are already underway. So we start with the Belt Road Initiative. This was announced in 2013, one year into President Xi's first term. And this is, how do I describe this? Perhaps the most ambitious, comprehensive, visionary, global infrastructure slash economic development project in human history. We're talking about probably several trillion dollars. I mean, the figures are anywhere from 900 billion to two, two and a half trillion dollars for starters. About 70 countries that have signed up to be able to obtain uh, Chinese provided loans, financial assistance, credits, uh, forms of financial support that are otherwise unavailable to countries and to markets that have difficulty accessing the international credit system. And they're able to work together so that the Chinese are designing and building major new ports, dams, highways, railways, bridges, tunnels, mostly land-based infrastructure, increasingly maritime infrastructure, so that China is able to develop what would in effect be a global supply chain empire that it would dominate. And the primary geographic target here is the Eurasian landmass, so that Chinese markets are able to traverse Central Asia, Eurasia, all the way to Europe, so that you already have today the longest highway in the world that connects the Pacific coastline to Spain, all the way across the Eurasian landmass. Now, one of the problems that we're seeing as this is manifested is what we call the phenomenon of predatory lending on the global stage, or, or what the administration is increasingly calling debt diplomacy. And we see this especially playing out with the ports and the maritime facilities that China is developing around the world. And let me just go, oh, wait, can I go back for a second? I can. Those of you, again, going back to history, if you recall reading about Marco Polo, and the Silk Road that connected European markets to Chinese markets centuries ago. This is again what we call sort of patterned on those Silk Road routes um, across the Eurasian landmass and across the Indian Ocean and into the Mediterranean Sea. But what we also see now is a series of European ports that are being uh, purchased or that are being invested in by uh, Chinese institutions. About a dozen ports, mostly smaller and mid-level ports, not the major ones like Rotterdam or Hamburg, at least not yet. But the Chinese strategy seems to be to get in small, to get in off the radar, and then over time begin to enlarge your investment and begin to have a more pronounced influence on that particular country's economy and on its political system. 
So we've seen this play out in Greece, ladies and gentlemen, so far. About 10 years ago, in the midst of Greece's financial crisis, the Chinese came in with half a billion dollars to buy up the Piraeus port that links the Mediterranean Sea to Central and Eastern European markets. But what we've also seen in the last several years is Greece now being somewhat dependent on China financially is starting to vote inside the European Union to block condemnations of China for human rights violations and for other violations of international law and international agreements. So is Belt Road simply an economic development project, an infrastructure project, or is it also a project to be able to accumulate geopolitical capital and influence in countries around the world to help squelch dissent and criticism of Chinese practices on the global stage? So that's phase one. Phase two is going to be the strategic competition between the US and the West versus China to see who's going to define and to dominate technology in the 21st century. And we see this playing out with, again, another Xi Jinping initiative called Made in China 2025. And this is where the Chinese government, and again, I'm using public domain sources, ladies and gentlemen, so this has all been available for years. I will just throw in a quick criticism. Our media has utterly failed us in educating the American people and our opinion leaders as to what has been happening openly around the world. But in this regard, uh, President Xi made very clear that China intends to be the world leader in at least a 10 or 12 major breakthrough technologies, robotics, driverless cars, uh, automation, biopharma, aerospace, uh, artificial intelligence, and 5G. So they've openly declared their intention to surpass the United States, Germany, Japan, and other leading technology markets. Well, in a free, fair, and open marketplace, that would be fine, right? We believe in competition, and whoever is able to outclass their competition prevails. But the concern that we have, especially with 5G, and you're hearing this now in the whole debate about Huawei, right, which is China's jewel company in telecommunications, is that we don't know to what extent the Chinese Communist Party actually controls Huawei. So if Huawei, which is probably the world's first class provider of both 5G hardware and software, a lot of this, again, unfortunately accumulated by theft. I mean, they completely stripped Cisco and Motorola of their IP 10 and 12 years ago. Um, but they face no serious competition, none from the US really to speak of, and maybe their major competitors are Nokia, Ericsson, and Samsung. But the concern that we have is that as Huawei is engaged in commercial contracting with, I think, about 50 countries to date, and increasingly expanding its global reach, we're concerned that the Chinese Communist Party will be able to use Huawei technology as a backdoor into Western systems that are then wired into this Huawei-controlled 5G network and be able to uh, engage in sabotage, shut down power grids, disrupt financial markets, um, and simply accumulate every bit of data on every human being possible who is connected to any system that's integrated into a Huawei-controlled 5G network, so that the Chinese Communist Party has all of your data at its disposal. The problem is that the United States has no real alternative to Huawei to offer, and so we're facing some diplomatic headwinds there in trying to persuade countries to not integrate their economies into Huawei's technology. I think to date we've only got Japan, Australia, New Zealand on board, Canada, and I believe that the United Kingdom will make a decision after its upcoming parliamentary elections. Um, and a number of European countries, including our NATO allies, have decided to buy into Huawei, but they're under the belief that they can distinguish between those systems that provide pure civilian uh, experiences and, and protect their particular systems against any type of military espionage. We'll see how this plays out. But this is going to be a grand competition on the technology stage in, in the years to come and potentially decades to come. But, but keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that President Xi stated very openly in October of 17 at a major plenary session of the Chinese Communist Party 
From his perspective, as long as he is the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, and this is a quote, the party leads everything. That means the government, the economy, China's society, China's schools, everything that matters in China is led by the Chinese Communist Party overtly or covertly. It all depends on the level of control that's required at any given time. So we need to be very mindful of this because I think we've let this fact elude us as we enjoyed China's peaceful rise over the last 20 years. But it really was a more liberalized China for much of this period until 2012. And it's really under Xi Jinping's leadership that the party has resumed a more muscular and overt control over all aspects of China's governance and society and economy. So please keep that in mind. And this is, again, all public domain. I'm giving you everything that's already out there in open books. And then the third phase of this US-China competition is China's intention to utterly dominate the Indo-Pacific region, that is, the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean regions. And I, I like to use this map. I borrowed this from another entity. And what it does is it takes the north-south axis and it turns it right over to one side so that we get a better sense of how China views the world, or at least its immediate region. Now, we Americans like to think of our presence in Asia as a relatively benign presence, right? We're there to maintain free and open shipping lanes, to make sure that no single power dominates the region so that we don't have a recurrence of what took place when uh, the uh, imperial forces of Japan completely blew apart Asia in the 1930s and 1940s. And so we've had this tremendous prosperity in East Asia under this rule-based order that I referenced earlier. Well, China does not see the US role as necessarily benign. They see the US as an alien, sometimes hostile power from across the globe, literally, in China's natural sphere of influence. And so what they also see is about 40,000 US troops in Japan, about 28,000 US troops in South Korea, major US arms sales to Taiwan to defend itself against a possible Chinese invasion, uh, US basing rights in the Philippines, and very close diplomatic ties that the United States enjoys with a number of ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia. And so China feels that this is an artificial, unnatural constraint on what should be China's natural propensity to grow, to expand, and to have greater control and influence over its historic sphere of influence. And so it's now determined to carry out a policy that will help it effectuate its strategy. It has doubled its defense budget in the last 10 years. Much of this, is, of course, has come with the wealth that China has enjoyed since joining the World Trade Organization 18 years ago. And it is now a defense budget that is second only to the United States, about $300 billion, even though there is no serious military threat whatsoever to China from any country anywhere in the world. But this is because China doesn't see a natural military threat. What they see really is a strategy to pull itself out of simply the Asian land continent, deeper into the Pacific, and into the Indian Ocean. So one of the ways it's beginning to do this is by exerting greater control over the South China Sea. So ladies and gentlemen, this, it's the lower part of this, what we call in Washington, the cow's tongue, right? You see the way this red line hangs low from China. And the South China Sea is, in many respects, besides the Indian Ocean, the world's most important maritime superhighway. About one third of the world's international commerce traverses the South China Sea. Uh, about uh, 15 to 20% of recoverable oil and natural gas lie in the seabed beneath the South China Sea. And it is also an area that is replete with fisheries um, that are providing a higher protein diet to millions of Asians and people around the world who are fleeing poverty and coming into what we would call at least a, a middle class type of lifestyle. But it is also an area that is being contested in terms of sovereignty by seven countries. And what China has done is simply say, well, we understand what international law says, but that's not really germane to us. This has been a historic Chinese sea going back, as I said before, thousands of years. It is a Chinese sea today. 
and they have essentially declared sovereignty over 80% of the South China Sea, 1,000 miles from its coastline, in complete violation of all international treaties and agreements, including the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty. So we also have a problem of militarization by China of a number of artificial islands that literally did not exist six or seven years ago. There are about 240 uh, geological features in the South China Sea, uh, atolls, uh, shoals, reefs. About 40 of these are above the surface year round, the remainder depending on tidal cycles. And on seven of these, the Chinese have undertaken a very ambitious strategy of dredging and reclaiming and weaponizing so that there are now Chinese anti-ship missile batteries, anti-aircraft batteries, radar systems, hangars that are able to provide for massive cargo planes, all hundreds of miles from the Chinese coastline. And again, in an area where nobody poses any serious military threat to this economic and military colossus. Uh, but what China is looking to do is to essentially control access through the South China Sea. And the only country that is able to prevent this from happening and to ensure that we have free and open shipping through this very important waterway is the United States. So first beginning under the Obama administration and now continuing under the Trump administration, we have a series of what we call in Washington phone ops. Those of you in the military know the terminology, F-O-N-O-P-S, Freedom of Navigation Operations. And we put our ships everywhere where we believe international law allows our ships to be. And we put our planes where we believe airplanes are allowed to be. We stay out of the territorial waters and airspace of every country, including China, but everything that international law proclaims is international, that is global commons, we put our ships and our planes into. The Chinese are not happy about this, and they're issuing diplomatic demarches all the time, but they're also a very patient government. And the question is going to be, what's going to happen one day when the Chinese decide that they're not going to let the US conduct these freedom of navigation operations any longer? I believe that's years away, but we may see some type of a challenge coming. And then ultimately, it's not only to gain control over the South China Sea, but to effectively push the US military back deeper into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, as far back as Hawaii. So we have a, another military term that we use, uh, anti-access area denial, to effectively deny the US the ability to engage in any type of military activity, even in international waters. In the South China Sea, what you see here is two red lines. You've got the first island chain from Japan down to the Philippines into Indonesia. And then eventually by 2049, when, again, ladies and gentlemen, the Chinese government has openly declared in speeches that are available online for anyone to read, they have proclaimed that they will provide for a world-class military, in other words, one with global reach by 2049, which happens to be the centennial of the founding of the People's Republic of China when the Communist Party took over in 1949 after the end of World War II. So their long-term strategy is to deny the US the ability to operate its military freely in the entire Eastern, uh, Western Pacific region by 2049. And their military budget today is getting them to that end point. Okay, so that's China. Let's talk a little bit about some other countries. The other major strategic disruptor on the world stage is Russia as it's currently ruled by Vladimir Putin. I believe Putin is 67 now, and he is in the beginning of what should be constitutionally his final term, so that he is constitutionally termed out in 2024, but he's been in power since 1999, and we'll see to what extent he decides to enjoy his wealth. He is the richest man on planet Earth, probably. Um, or whether he decides to retain power, because if he ever leaves power, he'll likely be executed by oligarchs or by other entities in Russia. But what we see in Vladimir Putin is a, a strategically brilliant disruptor who takes advantage of, of power vacuums in Europe, in the Middle East, and elsewhere to demand respect for Russia as a European, a Eurasian, and as a global power. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, we often forget that Russia is a vast country that actually demands respect, whether we want to confer it or not, on any given day, simply by its sheer size, right? 
It occupies one-eighth of the world's landmass across 11 time zones. It is able to project power in Europe, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, in South Asia, and as far east as Japan and North Korea, with which it actually shares a small border. But I want to give you something a little bit different than what we've been hearing about Russia for the last couple of years here in the United States. And I want to take you to what's going to be a next great strategic theater of competition globally, and that's in the Arctic region. So the Arctic region along Russia's frontier has seen uh, significant warming trends over the last 10 to 15 years so that geologists believe that many of the uh, shallow waters along Russia's coastline will be accessible for six to nine months out of the year in about five to 10 years. And we're gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive in a moment. But first I wanna give you a sense of what else is available in the Arctic region from a global economic perspective. And we're looking first of all at the fact that about 12% of the world's recoverable oil is believed to lie beneath the Arctic seabed and as much as 30% of the world's recoverable natural gas, again, beneath the Arctic seabed. Today, we have international agreements in place that regulate the exploitation of hydrocarbons in the Arctic region. The question is, how long will these agreements be respected? And will there be other considerations that come into play from countries that have lesser regard for these types of agreements playing out in the years to come? But because of these shipping lanes that will soon be opened up along Russia's frontier, we already have several ships that have done test runs, and we have the possibility of the next great maritime superhighway connecting Asia to European markets. And uh, I believe today it takes about 48 days on average to get from Chinese coastline to major European ports through the Indian Ocean and the Suez Canal. And you may be able to cut that down to about 35 days if you are going across the Russian uh, Northwest Passage, as it's called. And so we'll see how this plays out in terms of international shipping. Uh, the Chinese will have a leg up on most other shippers because the waters, again, are relatively shallow north of Russia, and so it's really smaller and medium-sized ships, not super tankers, that'll be able to, to do these, um, that'll run through these lanes. But we also have a situation where China is beginning to see the potential here for, as we talked about before, that we have a, a land-based Silk Road, the Maritime Silk Road, and now it's being called, in China, the Polar Silk Road. And they're looking to see how China, which is not an Arctic power, right? There's no, there's no part of Chinese territory that is in the Arctic region. But it's proclaimed itself a country with pronounced uh, Arctic interests. And so they've already begun to design how they will exploit these shipping lanes that should be available by about 2030 on a more systematic basis. And you see here how they're looking to access not only European markets, but also the eastern seaboard of the United States through these faster shipping lanes across the Arctic. And uh, just a quick side note, we're allowed a little bit of levity here. I know that we all thought it was a little bit puzzling when the administration was talking about acquiring Greenland a couple of months ago. Greenland is that yellow mass. Yeah, I don't have the clicker, the pointer here. That yellow mass just underneath Canada, right in the center of the map. But you may not know that in 2017 and 2018, Chinese government officials were in Greenland looking to uh, acquire territory to build three airfields in the southeastern corner of Greenland. And it was only when then Secretary of Defense James Mattis went to Denmark, which controls Greenland, and persuaded them to not sell any, or to not even make available any type of leasing to China to build airfields there, because Greenland actually is a very important strategic component of North American security against possible nuclear missiles coming in from Russia or China across the Arctic. So a little extra on Greenland there, if you might. Um, but the Russians are looking to completely dominate, at least for the initial phase of this opening of the Arctic shipping lanes. They are uh, building or refortifying about a dozen new, uh, two dozen, I think it is, two dozen, airfields and naval facilities all along the Arctic frontier. And uh, they will ensure that any companies that need to access Russia's territorial waters 
will have to pay the appropriate fee to Russia to exploit these brand new shipping lanes. So this is a little ways out, but Russia is moving very aggressively to consolidate control over these shipping lanes. And there are already Chinese-Russian partnerships in terms of natural gas exploitation along Russia's coastline, not in the middle of the North Pole region. But that exploitation of natural resources has begun. So as we kind of go across the Arctic region to Northeast Asia, a little bit on North Korea, ladies and gentlemen, because I'll talk about two rogue concerns that we have. North Korea, we're going to see this issue come up again in the next uh, several weeks because there's a December 31 deadline that's been imposed on the White House by Kim Jong-un, who I believe is 35. Um, and you know we tend to think of him as a madman. I tend to look at him as a completely rational leader who says, I want to continue running my mafia-like regime here in North Korea. And having 20 to 30 nuclear weapons means that nobody will attack me. Nobody will look to overthrow my government because I can destroy South Korea in a matter of hours if anyone chooses to do so. So in terms of deterrence for self-preservation, I think it's actually quite smart. And it's why the Iranians, and we'll talk about them in a second, are looking to pursue nuclear weapons on ballistic missiles as well. But uh, the problem that we have, ladies and gentlemen, is we, we don't have agreement between the US and North Korea as to what constitutes, <clears throat> pardon me, um, complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization. So the US wants the end of nuclear weapons in North Korea. And North Korea says, well, I'll think about denuclearizing partially if you start to eliminate some of these sanctions that are destroying my economy. Um, I, there's a sense that there might be a restart of talks, and there are US and North Korean officials that are discussing the possibility of renewed talks before December 31. Otherwise, we will likely see a renewed series of very threatening North Korean nuclear weapons and ballistic missile tests, as we saw four or five years ago, getting North Korea to where it is today. And what complicates our diplomatic efforts in this part of the world is the fact that Japan and South Korea are now at loggerheads. I don't have the time to go into it here, but World War II reparations. There are economic sanctions. There's an end to military intelligence sharing between the two countries. And there are now sovereignty disputes in the East China Sea between Japan and South Korea, who are our two most important allies in this part of the world. And one of the concerns that we have in this region is not only the issue of denuclearization of North Korea, but God forbid any type of a conventional conflict that might take place between any of the parties that would bring in the world's number two economy, China, on behalf of North Korea, the number three economy, Japan, the number 11 economy, Russia, the number 12 economy, South Korea, the number 20 economy, Taiwan, let alone the US if it has to defend Japan or South Korea. But any conventional conflict in this part of Asia would destroy some of the world's most vital global supply chains. So let's go to the other rogue element that we're dealing with. We have a radical Shia theocracy in Iran that has been looking to destabilize the Middle East ever since this theocracy came to power in 1979. They are targeting Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. And they are threatening, on a constant basis, critical allies of the US and the West, such as Israel and Saudi Arabia. We have an 80-year-old Ayatollah Khamenei. He's the figure on the left. I, I use this photo deliberately, folks, because we often talk about Iranian presidents, but they're only the president of the country because the supreme leader allows them to be. And Ayatollah Khamenei at 80 is in ailing health, and one of the things that we're looking for very closely in Washington is the potential for a severe political crisis in Iran if Ayatollah Khamenei passes from the scene, uh, and th there's no smooth transition process in place. All we know is that his successor will almost certainly demand continued clerical rule in Iran and to maintain an implacably hostile position against the United States, Israel, and the West more broadly. So to counter this, this particular administration, in a 180 degree away from the prior administration, which looked to engage Iran and bring it into the international community, if I can use that phrase. It's a lousy phrase, but I'll explain some other time. Um, Mohammed bin Salman, the 34-year-old ruthlessly aggressive reformer of Saudi Arabia's economy, society, 
and, and regional and domestic posture. We have a number of problems with the level of governance in Saudi Arabia, ladies and gentlemen, and it is one of the most difficult to reconcile with American and Western values. There's no doubt about that. But the problem that we have is that Saudi Arabia still produces about 10 to 12 percent of the world's daily oil production, and we don't need it in the United States, but our allies in Asia and Europe are utterly dependent on Saudi and larger Middle Eastern oil and natural gas supplies to literally lubricate their economies. And what you see here is a sense of how we still have this concentration of reserves of oil and natural gas largely in the Middle East, which is the primary reason the US, whatever voters want, whatever this particular administration may want, cannot fully disengage from the Middle East anytime soon. The US economy is in a, is in a stage of energy resilience. We're about to become both the world's largest net exporters of oil and natural gas in the years to come. But our allies still depend on the Middle East. And we'll see how oil and natural gas markets continue to be disrupted by the shale revolution, right? That's come about because of hydraulic fracturing. And the possibility that the United States, especially in areas such as Colorado and in the Permian Basin, may be sitting on top of hundreds of billions of barrels of oil and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas still to be discovered. And much of this will depend on whether or not hydrocarbons continue to be the dominant energy source in the decades to come, or whether technology will bring about some significant breakthrough. But for anyone who's planning today, 10, 20, 30 years out, hydrocarbons will be the dominant energy source uh, on the global stage. And so it's one of the reasons why the stability of Saudi Arabia is considered so important in Washington. Again, with all of the problems of governance and repression and very, very stupid decisions made by the Riyadh government in recent years on a whole host of matters, look where Saudi Arabia is situated, at the heart of three of the world's four most important choke points. And if there is a crisis inside of Saudi Arabia and you have a civil war and a breakdown of the oil markets in Saudi Arabia with the spillover in the Arabian Peninsula, you get a sense here of how highly disruptive this would be to global commercial activity. Um, okay, let me just go past this because I'm running out of time here. So I want to close out with uh, Africa and Europe. Your Africa, if I might. And Africa is, an, is a continent which really has many of the world's fastest urbanizing regions anywhere today. And we've associated it with famine, with underdevelopment, with war, with poverty. But I would look at Africa as an area of great opportunity and tremendous investment potential. Uh, the US really hasn't strategically engaged Africa. We have trade levels of several tens of billions of dollars, some significant investment, but nothing on a strategic level. We tend to look at Africa really as, a, as an area where we can secure natural resources and where we can defeat these new Islamic terror networks up in the Sahara Desert, you know, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State offshoots in Northern Africa. But uh, the Chinese, to their, um, to their benefit, and, and I have to give them credit to, uh, for this, have invested or in traded a total of about $2 trillion worth of goods and investment and services in the African continent since 2005. Uh, they have built up over 50 ports and rail networks throughout the continent. And in many ways, the degree to which we're talking about a possible shift of global supply chains out of China, maybe to ASEAN countries, perhaps Indonesia, India, which is probably still at least a decade out from ever really replacing China on that level. Africa has the potential to be the world's next factory floor with the level of infrastructure development that's come in from China over the last 15 years. And so seven of the world's 20, 20 fastest growing uh, economies are in Africa, and about a dozen countries are enjoying growth rates of four, five, six percent a year for the foreseeable future. Great news in Africa, a continent beset by bad news, but that provides for about 10 to 12 million new jobs throughout Africa every year. But the problem is that Africa's population is growing by about 30 to 32 million a year. There won't be enough jobs to provide for all of the citizens that are coming into being in African countries in the years and decades to come. 
And where will many of these people likely go to be able to attain that level of economic opportunity that they may still be denied in their native country? They will likely go to Europe. Today, African migrants can get to Europe if they pay traffickers around 2,000 euros per person. It's a horrible, disgusting business, but this is just the nature of criminality. And so there is a profit to be made, and there are hundreds of thousands of Africans that are in the pipeline now heading to Europe. We saw what happened in, inside of Europe in 2015 when about 800,000 migrants and refugees came in from the Middle East and South Asia. Well, what is Europe going to do when millions of people coming in from Africa are coming into their shores and the European economies are not at the level of growth and an opportunity they were before the 2008 crisis. So we see some significant challenges in many of Europe's most important and dynamic economies, laggard economies in the last year to year and a half. We also see um, Europe that is beset by security challenges from Russia, which still dominates energy supplies into Europe, oil and natural gas which undermines democratic systems in many European uh, political uh, networks and is also threatening Europe increasingly in Poland and the Baltics and with the deployment of nuclear-capable cruise missiles that were not permitted under a recent agreement that the US just withdrew from because the Russians had violated the agreement. So Europe is under increasing security pressure. It has economic challenges it faces, and that's leading to precarious and unsettled politics where the center parties seem to be collapsing. And you see here the bars on the left, the more important issues for many European voters uh, on the nativist side tend to be about migration and national identity or a sense of lost national identity. And so you've got far right nativist parties and you've got far left eco-radical parties that are gonna be promoting a very green agenda, heavy, heavy regulation at the expense of economic growth. And what this does to European politics remains to be seen, ladies and gentlemen, but what we see here is growing Euro skepticism in many European countries. The people are concerned about whether or not the European Union will remain a cohesive entity in the years to come. I'm going to apologize, but I believe my time has run out. Is that the case, Lockton? Keep going, okay. So five minutes, if I can. Uh, so we have this problem here in, in terms of the future of Europe, which is the single largest economic trading partner of the United States, and really our partner in terms of democratic values and sort of the support for the free and open international system that we've been so much a part of, so important for upholding so that we can enjoy the level of prosperity and the quality of life that we enjoy in the West and we want to share with people who are coming out of poverty worldwide. I'm gonna close on what's been happening in Latin America, especially in Venezuela, ladies and gentlemen, because this is something that pops up every once in a while. It was major news earlier this year, but we haven't resolved what's happening in Venezuela, and it's not just about Venezuela. We have a humanitarian crisis, to be sure. Four million Venezuelans have fled the country, about 15% of the population, in ways that could be destabilizing for important uh, partners such as Brazil and Colombia, which are absorbing most of these refugees. But we also have the international dynamic of, call it meddling, call it intervention, by countries such as China, to which Venezuela is indebted to the tune of about 20 to $25 billion. And what China has done in other countries that are unable to pay back the terms of loans made under the Belt Road Initiative, they've seized control of those sovereign assets, ports, seaports, airports, uh, rail links, and the question is, does China begin to grab sovereign assets of Venezuela and literally plant itself on the Latin American and the South American continent? Russia has been selling billions of dollars worth of weaponry to the Maduro regime to keep it in power, and just about six weeks ago, several hundred more Russian troops arrived in strategic bombers in Venezuela to help prop up that government. The Iranian government, through Hezbollah, has been using the Maduro government to implant drug trafficking networks in South America and to help advance a cocaine trafficking network that reaches into the United States through Venezuela. And Cuba really props up the Venezuelan government with thousands of Cuban operatives who are, who are working to keep Maduro in power in exchange for 
oil, which is provided to the Cuban economy to keep that economy propped up, and whatever surplus oil Cuba has, it sells to generate hard cash for its otherwise depressed economy. So it's a geopolitical chaos in Venezuela that we haven't been able to unknot in any way. And we are very much concerned that it won't be a civil war anytime soon, because in a civil war, both sides have to have weapons. And in Venezuela, only the government has weapons. The citizens don't. But the question is, are we going to have a literally failed state and the completely unpredictable chaos that spills over into Latin America and perhaps into Central America? And from a US perspective, we have this border situation between Texas and Mexico right now. What happens if one or two or three million Venezuelans are streaming up Central America to come into the relative safety and prosperity of the United States? So I have fire hosed you with all of these dire warnings about what's happening around the world. So I want to just end on this note, ladies and gentlemen. The United States enjoys built-in advantages over almost, over almost every other country in the world of decades of economic power of a level that no other country has known before, but which China is closely approaching. The world's most powerful military, but I think more importantly, for those of us here in this room and for the, the work that you all do in global insurance and risk management, keep in mind that the United States enjoys vast labor, financial, and consumer markets. We have political institutions that are strong even when te they're tested the way they are being today. We have great social cohesion in America. We have food and natural resource abundance. We have energy resilience. And we have a sense that our, our innovative dy dynamic economy can overcome any type of challenge in a free and open competitive marketplace. So we have decades of built-in advantages where I think the US remains in a largely preeminent position on the world stage, a preeminence that we're able to share with our allies and partners around the world. But I do believe that we're entering a period where we're going to see severe strategic competition. I hope it doesn't become an ideological competition where we literally have two ecosystems on the technology front and then two economic systems in terms of all types of commercial activity around the world. I don't know how the US-China strategy will play out, but it is clearly going to be the dominant force in international relations and international commerce in the years and decades to come. And um, I will close on that note. I wish you all a very successful and productive conference. And I thank you all very much again for your time, your interest, and in welcoming me here today. So thank you all very much. Thank you.